Hello everybody, this is Slugwave again. I want to try something a little bit different for this video. Um, after I made my home tour video from the Elder Scrolls Online, I realized the game itself has a lot of really nice ambient noises that would be uh, conducive to ASMR. So it got me thinking about other parts of the game that might be good for making an ASMR video. And the first place I thought of was Merkmire, which for those who don't know, um, is part of Black Marsh, um, which is the homeland of uh, the Argonian race. And uh, it's an area of Tamriel that is basically all swampland, so there's a lot of rain sounds, thunder, frogs, crickets, and just a lot of generally peaceful ambience that I thought would be perfect a video and it got me thinking even though I play an Argonian as my main character I don't actually know a whole lot about the Argonian lore in the game so I thought I would do a little research and talk about uh, Argonian lore um, while I uh, play some uh, ambient video in the background of Black Marsh and also include any kind of relevant landmarks um, that the history touches upon that's actually in the game. Um, I decided to narrow the scope of this video so that it didn't get too large, so I'm only going to be talking about Argonian history and not so much culture or their spiritual beliefs, so it's really just going to be more the historical events, and it's going to be up until the year that the Elder Scrolls Online takes place, which is the second era, year 583. Um, so I'm only really going to be talking about history, Argonian history, up until that point. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to, to mention is I wanted to be very upfront about the source material that I'm using in this video. Uh, everything that I am uh, citing either comes from the actual lore books, the Elder Scroll lore books, or it comes from the Elder Scrolls wiki. Uh, there are parts um, where I've either paraphrased or directly taken sentences from the wiki or from the lore books themselves. Anything that I used in this video, I will provide a link to that page in the description below. Um, but I just wanted to be uh, sort of upfront about where the source material this video comes from. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. The Argonians of Black Marsh have always been one of the more marginalized races in Tamriel. Fortunately, most of their early history has been lost to time, even amongst the Argonians themselves. According to the lore book, Pocket Guide to the Empire 3rd Edition Argonia, the region of Black Marsh has long been called the garbage heap of Tamriel, and no land in the Empire is as undocumented or unexplored. Since the days of the early Aldemary explorers, who described themselves witnessing the fetid, evil swamplands and their human lizards, the Black Marsh has held a reputation of being a place no one would want to live in, man or mare, 
which it maintains into the present date. However, to others, it is a place shrouded in mystery and beauty. The historian Brendan the Persistent wrote, The Argonian people have, throughout the Tamrilic history, been perhaps the most misunderstood, vilified, and reviled of all the sentient races. Yet, those who have taken the time to experience Argonian culture have gained a greater appreciation for this noble and beautiful race. It should be noted that the historian disappeared during his final expedition into the deeper swamps of Black Marsh. The first edition of the Pocket Guide to the Empire tells us that while humans refer to the region as Black Marsh, the elves have taken to calling it Argonia, after an ancient battlefield where many of their ancestors fell. Thus, the native inhabitants of the Swamplands, a collection of beastly tribes of lizard men, have become, in common parlance, the Argonians. Most citizens of the Empire use the term Argonian. The Argonians themselves usually refer to themselves as the Saxheel, meaning people of the root. According to the Varieties of Faith volume on Argonians, the Argonians worship neither Adra nor Daedra. They do not have religion as it is known elsewhere in Tamriel. They are known to venerate the histories of Black Marsh, and also venerate Sithis, a primordial shadow of chaos that exists before the gods were born. Unlike most citizens of Tamriel, Argonians do not regard Sithis as evil. However, this was not always the case. In the earliest known period of Argonian history, referred to as the Stone Nest Period. Sithis was seen by the Argonians as a malevolent force that needed to be appeased in order to avoid destruction. The ancient Argonians believed Sithis was always watching, waiting to destroy the world and return existence into the void. They had several rituals including live blood sacrifice to demonstrate their devotion to Sithis, but much of this devotion was driven by fear of death and impermanence. This is the time period in which many of the large pyramids, known as Sanmir, were built throughout Black Marsh as a symbolic means for the Argonian tribes to withstand the test of time in the face of impermanence. Ruins from this time period can still be seen throughout Black Marsh today, within the Tosavir Cavern. The Tomb of Many Spears. The Kinji Konu Monument. and the teeth of Sithis. The decline of the Stone Nest period happened gradually in an event that is referred to as the Dusk Ball. Very little is known about what exactly transpired during the Dusk Ball, but what is known is that there was a paradigm shift in the way Argonians viewed Sithis. A coalition of Sithis preachers, known collectively as the Clutch of Nisru, began to recognize Sithis not just as a force of destruction, but as a catalyst of creation and change. The Clutch of Nisru adopted a more cyclical view of time and viewed the old beliefs of their ancestors as misguided. 
their ancestors' fear of death and resistance to change were not only futile, but may have accelerated their decline. The Niswa refer to the old beliefs as Shunate, the fear of death and change. Shunate is a fear that must be conquered and overcome. The Zanmir ruins throughout Black Marsh are living symbols of Shunate. This is why modern Oregonians now build permanent structures for themselves as a symbol of becoming one with change. Modern Argonians recognize that their structures will be destroyed in time, no matter what they do to try to stop it. Throughout the first era, Argonians seldom left Black Marsh, and those that did usually preferred to assimilate into the culture they immigrated into rather than carry on their Saxial customs within the Empire. During the First Empire, the Alessian Empire, Black Marsh became a place where bandits and fugitives would flee to evade imperial law. The coastline became infamous for piracy. The most notorious of these bandits was the Red Brahmin, otherwise known as the Bandit King. The Empress's desire to capture Red Brahmin brought Argonians into contact with the Empire for the first time during the First Era. According to the Improved Emperor's Guide to Tamriel, in the First Era 1033, Empress Hestra dispatched the Imperial Navy to pursue and capture the crimson-haired pirate. Traveling up the winding river east of Topol Bay, breathing thickets, fox-carrying insects, and humidity, the skirmishers tracked and beheaded Brahmin with his brigand kingdom, close to the settlement of Black Rose. On their return to the Empress, cruise members spoke of the true culture of Black Marsh for the first time. The Argonians distrusted men after witnessing Brahmin's antics of pillaging and slavery. They resisted the Empire's efforts to encroach into their land along the old pirate routes, and exploration halted as the First Empire waned. The Alessian Empire abandoned further settlement, and it was content to leave Black Marsh to the Argonians. All of this changed more than 1500 years later with the Revan Dynasty, founded by Revan Cyrodiil in the First Era 2703. Revan sought to control all regions of Tamriel and ordered the seizure of the northern and eastern portions of Argonia, leading to what would be known as the Blackwater War. According to the Traveler's Guide to Gideon, Emperor Remen II marshaled great resources to the task of incorporating Argonia into his realm. Powerful legions marched into the Empire's southeastern frontier, building roads and fortifications from which to conduct the Emperor's campaigns. The Imperials had several initial victories towards the beginning of the war, but stagnated as the war evolved into a complex guerrilla war spanning over three decades. Volume 2 of the Blackwater War recounts the army, which had claimed hundreds of victories on the rolling fields of Cyrodiil, was utterly unprepared to deal with the fetid bogs of Black Marsh. To begin with, the Legion's gear was ill-suited for such an environment. Their armor, for instance, was heavy and prone to rust in the moist climate. Legionnaires spent hours scraping the mud from their boots and shields, 
desperately trying to lighten the load they carried into battle. By the end of the second year, legionnaires had abandoned their curiouses and griefs entirely, preferring to die comfortably rather than drenched in sweat inside of a metal suit. The battle tactics the Imperials had developed over the centuries were just as useless as their armor in this inhospitable place. Their system of cohort deployment and rigid line organization was impossible to implement in the swampy interior. The thick cypress growth and sloppy terrain consistently fragmented the group resulting in a tangled mass of small skirmishes that the Argonians routinely won. The chain of command deteriorated quickly in such conditions. This rapidly gave way to rampant insubordination and morale-draining power struggles among the troops. Finally, the marsh itself seemed to devour whole cohorts at a time. Rumors and half-truths constantly swirled around Legion campfires. Some assumed that the missing cohorts became lost and disoriented, dying of hunger and thirst before finding their way back to a safe location. Others blamed the greatly feared ghost warriors, pale and hideous Argonians of gruesome reputation. There were even whisperings about some dark and malevolent creature lurking under the swamp that ate whole phalanxes in a single bite. Such rumors were clearly false, but had a significant impact on troop morale. This complication of setbacks and circumstances set the stage for years of calamitous warfare. Thousands of soldiers would die before the end of hostilities finally came to Black March. Volume 5 of the Blackwater War recounts how the 26 year war finally came to a close. Rather than an official armistice, the war seemed to simply end in the late First Era. 2,836. Argonians, who had been fighting Imperials for decades, abruptly buried their weapons and went back to farming, fishing, and weaving, without rendering a formal surrender. The Empire wasted no time in officially claiming the region. At long last, the Blackwater War came to a sudden and inexplicable end. The Argonians' abrupt cessation of hostilities is just another in a long series of mysteries associated with this conflict. The prevailing assumption was that their bizarre tree-worshipping tradition had something to do with it, but we may never know why they actually laid down their weapons. As a historian, it's a vexing situation, but mysteries born in the deep murk of Black Marsh are seldom solved. At least, they are seldom solved to a satisfying conclusion. With the closure of the war, the Remen Dynasty seized control over portions of Black Marsh, and the region was officially incorporated into the Cyrodelic Empire. Coastal areas were far safer areas for outsiders to travel. The imperial leaders were sent there to govern in the emperor's name. Cities such as Lilamoth, originally a settlement of the now extinct Lilamoth race, fell under imperial control. Today, the ruins of the old imperial villas built during the occupation are still present in the city though most have been reclaimed by nature. According to History of Lomoth, one sees only shadows of the Empire's influence now, such as when visiting Old Imperial Lomoth. 
There you will find a gallery of half-sunken villas, covered in moss and decay. The swamp has indeed claimed this place, just as the Argonians reclaimed Black Marsh. The Second Empire elected to turn Black Marsh into a remote prison state meant for criminals who could not be contained within conventional dungeons in Cyrodiil. Two such notorious prisons were the White Rose and Black Rose Prisons. Black Rose was known to be one of the worst prisons in Tamriel. In A History of Black Rose Prison, the author tells us, Imperial prisoners were sent to Black Rose Prison only for the most heinous or politically charged crimes. This was where men and mare alike were sent when the reigning power wished to never see them again. As such, the accountability of prison staff was near non-existent. The brutality and cruelty that these prisoners faced was, by all accounts, particularly horrid. Given its convenient location, all Merkmire natives who conflicted with the imperial power would wind up within Black Rose prison as well. Nagas, in particular, were apt to find their way there, given their rebellious nature against imperial oppression. Even among their fellow prisoners, Nagas were treated with particular disdain, most likely provoked by their aggressive culture and drastic appearance. It is theorized that an increase in the Naga prisoner population, as well as a decline in imperial power in the region, it is theorized that an increase in the Naga prisoner population, as well as a decline in the imperial power in the region, led to mass riots that eventually forced Black Rose prison to be abandoned. Prisons in Black Marsh held several of Cyrodiil's most infamous criminals, including Tavia, the wife of the last emperor of the First Era, Remen III. She had been imprisoned for treason by her own husband and held within Castle Geoves outside the town of Gideon. While imprisoned, she conspired to assassinate her husband via contact with the Morag Tong. The author of the Travel's Guide to Gideon recounts, The castle grounds were far from uncomfortable, but a gilded cage was still a cage, and the Empress bent all of her formidable ambition and intellect the goal of removing her estranged husband from the throne so that she could return from her exile. After the assassination of Remen III, the end of the First Era was declared, and with the lapse in power, the Argonians used the opportunity to become an autonomous region once more. With the dawn of the Second Era, chaos was reintroduced to Black Marsh. Fugitives and bandits had returned to the area, and the Dunmer slave traders were freer than ever to exploit the Argonian people. Thousands of years prior, the Chimer had raided the region of Black Marsh to use the Argonian people as slaves dragging off entire tribes to the various regions of Morrowind. By the beginning of the Second Era, this practice resumed in full force. 
some done more justified their practice of slavery as a way to civilize and better the Argonian race. In the book, Argonians Among Us, written from a Donmer's perspective, the author recounts, As the second era dawned, we began working with the Argonians in earnest. Whole tribes were evacuated to the safety and dry climates of Vardenfell, Stonefalls, and Fishel. We offered them appropriate foodstuffs and taught them the way of civilized culture. We fashioned garments to hide their more shameful features and sent them into the world so they could learn and serve in new environs. In return for our generosity, we asked so little of the Argonians, and yet not all denizens of that fitted place feel true appreciation. According to the Improved Emperor's Guide to Tamriel, Argonians spent much of the second era under the tightening bonds of Morrowind's slave traders and wayward imperial warlords, as the instability of Tamriel furthered exploitative practices and banditry. Although turmoil affected both man and mare, none were more downtrodden than those of reptilian form. Then, in the year 560 of the Second Era, a plague began to upend daily lives throughout Tamriel. The illness was known as the Crenadin Flu. The plague originated in the city of Stormhold, a capital city in Black Marsh built atop old alien settlements. The disease spread throughout every corner of Black Marsh like wildfire, but for whatever reason, the Argonians were immune to the flu, leaving them seemingly untouched by a plague that had decimated almost the entire non Argonian population in Black Marsh. This led to speculation that the Argonians somehow introduced the flu to retaliate for years of slavery at the hands of the Dunmer. Rumors spread that the plague had originated with an Argonian tribal shaman who created the diseases through a manipulation of their chairs spore trees. This theory was popularly accepted as the cause of the disease. The plague would ravage the area over the next few decades, driving out many outsiders from the land and decimating entire races, among them the Kosmingi and the Lomothet. According to the Pocket Guide to the Empire 3rd Edition Argonia, even when the plague eventually subsided, fear of the disease kept outsiders away from Black Marsh. Only house dress of Morrowind firmly enmeshed in the slave trade continued to travel into the area. It is said that even Tyler Septum thought twice before conquering Black Marsh for his new empire. About twelve years after the flu emerged, the Argonians found themselves in an unexpected and unlikely situation, allying themselves with the Nord and Dunmer during the second Agavarian invasion. This invasion was also referred to as the Liberation War by the Argonians. Akaviri forces had ravaged the city of Windhelm in Skyrim, leaving a ruined city behind. As the forces made their way to Riften, they found the city to be too heavily fortified by the Nords. 
the Akaviri army instead decided to bypass Riften and redirect their attack towards Morrowind. The Dunmeri army, led by Almalexia, fought hard against the attack, but were forced to retreat to Stone Falls. With more Akaviri fleet approaching on the horizon, it seemed defeat for the Dunmer and Norths was all but inevitable. During this invasion, an Argonian slave by the name of Haitami had just attempted to escape her master, Councilman Glathis Drez, in the city of Thorn. As she fled the Thorn Marsh along with her fellow slaves, they were captured by a group of fellow Argonians, the Achaean tribe, who were employed by House Drez and had every intention of returning the slaves to their master. In Hayden Bean's personal memoir, From Argonian to Saxiel, she recounts the events that followed her capture. In the Archean village, a vision came to me, the history spoke, showing me blood and horror, the Akaviri invasion, Nords and Dunmer falling like dead leaves. This was an opportunity, a turning point, but how could I take advantage? We were taken back to Thorn, now nearly empty as the Dunmer answered Almalexia's call to battle. My transgression, I was to be whipped by Glathis himself. In the courtyard, Glathis struck his first lash. I grabbed his whip and strangled him with it. I'll never forget the look he gave me as the light drained from his eyes. Wasting no time, I challenged the centurion of the Archean Guard for her position by right of combat. She could not refuse and maintain any respect from her cohort. The duel was brief. I assumed command and advanced on Stormhold to do the same there. I am thankful that I did not need to shed any further Saxial blood. Wax and Ash, who met us as we approached, was able to convince Stormhold's shellbacks to join our command. I revealed my plan. We would march to Morrowind into Stone Falls and engage in battle with the Akaviri. We would defend the Dunmer and turn the tide. To say some disagreed with my strategy would be quite an understatement. I told of my vision from the Hist, let any who wished to return to the marsh do so. Still strong in numbers, we marched. When we arrived in the chaos of battle, there were fear on the faces of the Dunmer who saw armed slaves charging towards them. The fear turned to shock as we joined the ranks, our shellbacks providing enough muscle to overpower the invaders and force them to flee. With the aid of the Argonians, fighting side by side with the Nords and Dunmer. The three races were able to drive the Akaviri forces into the sea to drown. It was in this moment that the Ebonheart Pact was formed. In response to the Argonians' aid, the Dunmer agreed to end the enslavement of Argonians. However, the practice of slavery overall did not end, and some done refused to accept the new policy. Those who refused withdrew from the pact, most notably House Delvani. Some Argonian tribes likewise refused to join the pact out of refusal to ally themselves with the Dunmer after thousands of years of slavery at their hands. But to others, the Ebonheart Pact meant a chance to better the lives of Argonians. 
he demeaned again recounts in from Argonian to Saxiel. Now we are recognized, we have allies, not overlords, for the first time in memory. We are free under the law, and we are taking back our villages and strengthening our traditions. There is still bitter there is still bitter blood flowing between many Saxiel and her new allies, and not every tribe has joined us. Only those of Thornmarsh, Shadowfen, and Merkmire. This is not a surprise. I hope that they will, in time, and realize that this opportunity we have been given to cultivate the understanding will allow us to preserve our way of life. These events lead us up to the current time period in which the Elder Scrolls Online takes place, year 583 of the Second Era. I hope you all have a wonderful night.